Good afternoon, everyone. You guys doing all right? Mm -hmm. I'm not doing. I'm not doing that well today. So we'll see oh, no. how far I can go. I was about to cancel the class, oh, no. but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, th I think I can go for one hour or so. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Uh, let's do a quick review of what we did last class, because I know that many of you weren't here. So. Let's just go quickly through that. Uh, the first thing that we did was to add a new failure criterion, which is called the late criterion, which is just a smoother version of the more Coulomb criterion. And these two criteria, they are a little bit uh, more conservative about the range of stresses to which you can get in the deviatoric plane. So in the deviatoric plane, Drucker Prager is a circle, but more Coulomb and Lake Criterion, uh, both of them, they, in triaxial extension, they get to a lower deviatoric stress at the mean isotropic stress. And that's a little bit more realistic for some uh, geomaterials. And here are the equations. And then we talk about a simplified version of all of these and in addition to the shear yield that we have been working with you should know that there is also a tensile cutoff because the shear yield usually overestimates tensile strength and on the right side there is a limit for compression and that's when compressions are too high grains start to break pores start to collapse and you cannot go either too far to the left or too far to the right the state of stress is limited by those three lines. Okay, and after we talked about that, we talked about project number six, which is going to be uh, computationally intensive. The first part is relatively easy. Just with your data, you get your criteria, failure criteria and yield criteria. And then based on that, you apply that to calculate where the rock would fail around the wellbore for any deviation and any orientation or azimuth of the wellbore. That's a matter in which direction the wellbore is doing. You can calculate what are the stresses at the wall of the wellbore. And based on that, you can tell whether this is a failure or not. So again, uh, if you couldn't attend last lecture just take a look at the at the video and uh, I go a little bit more in detail about what you have to do uh, in here but the procedure is about the same as for a vertical wellbore it's just a little bit more complicated about calculating stresses for a deviated wellbore with a deviation deviation such that the principal stresses do not coincide with the orientation of the wellbore okay so now we're going to continue talking about plasticity. And for this case, for project number six, we are, we, we are not really doing any plastic calculation. We are just telling what is the limit for when we get to failure or yield or not. But we're not doing any plastic calculation. And that's what we're going to do now, at least uh, theoretically. And you're going to do it later in the homework too. And we'll see uh, what is the meaning of that. Okay, so what we're going to do right now is to extend the prediction of strains to whenever we get to yield. And I'm going to call this section beyond the yield point in analogy with the, the book of, if you want to read a little bit more about this, I recommend the book from uh, Fire et al. Does any of you speak Norwegian? I'd like to know how to pronounce his name. But uh, this author, okay? Okay. 
And here, again, our objective is going to be to predict strains which are plastic uh, beyond the yield point. For the elastic part, that's something that we already know. And uh, either if we use isotropic elasticity or anisotropic elasticity, uh, basically our equation is that strains are going to be proportional to the compliance matrix uh, here, uh, this one, we should call it IJ, uh, I don't, let me, let me see which one I use. Let's call it MN for stress MN and with this elastic theory, any increment of elastic strain is just going to be proportional to the matrix times an increment of stress. What is the subscript of yeah, this is the initial notici notation for the matrix. This is the same as this. But we're going to start now working with some initial notation, so I wanted to put it in terms of initial notation. But the, the, on the main idea about this is that we can calculate the strains by multiplying, in this case, the compliance matrix times the change of stress. That is the elastic part. We know how to do that. I give you stress, and with the compliance matrix populated with Young modular and Poisson ratio, you can tell me what strain is. That's the less elastic part, and uh, there's no problem with that. Now, our objective is going to be to predict the plastic strains. And we want to know what is going to be the change of plastic strain due to a change on stress. That's our objective. And we'll see that this is not as easy as for elasticity. It's actually a lot more complicated, but, but still the concept uh, it's, it's not that complicated, and uh, and for certain applications, uh, we need to, to use plasticity. In fact, elasticity is very limited, and uh, for many actual problems, real problems, we need to start using uh, plasticity. Okay, so uh, let's get into that, and there are going to be uh, five things that we're going to have to to work with in order to do these predictions. And we're going to limit uh, uh, the theory that we're going to work with to some assumptions to make it more or less easy to work with. The first assumption that is going to be this is going to be small strain. Uh, it's going to be also a continuous strain field which means that I cannot have a fracture in, in this type of model. And we are also going to assume that this is rate independent. And with rate, I mean the rate of loading. So that means it doesn't matter in how much time we load the, the rock, the response is going to be the same. All right. So Let's go with those five things that we need. First of all, we need something that we already have. So that's, that's good news. And that's going to be a yield criterion. 
The yield criterion is what we have already discussed, and it's basically an equation, like in general, a function of sigma ij, a function of the stresses, such that when you get to yield, that's equal to a constant. And this could be any of the yield criteria that we have seen so far. More Coulomb, Drucker Prager, Tresca, uh, anything. That's going to be just an equation. Second, we need something which is called strain hardening rule. And what this is going to tell you is that what is the value of this constant as a function, let's call it F2, of the plastic strain. So you remember that this is a failure criterion. Um, we related many times this to the yield stress, right? This Y was a yield stress. What I'm telling here is that if I have some pl plastic strain, that yield stress might change. So a material may get stronger as you have more plastic strain, and in some other cases, it may get weaker as you have more plastic strain. So that this is not going to be a constant anymore, but it's going to be a function of this plastic strain. In terms of the yield surface, we could say like the radius of this circle is going to change depending on if I go, go through some plastic strain or not. It's not a constant anymore. Jack, do you have a question? Uh, because here we're just telling which state of stress gets to the yield surface. Okay. And that yield surface may be one value, but if you go through some plastic strain, it might change. So why is it depend on both strains? So why not put a function like this constant that is incompatible both? Because right now we have plastic strain, right? So the reason for that is that now we can go to paths of irreversible strain. So you cannot put it as just one function because at time zero, it might go through yield and at some other time it might not. So it's not going to be always the same value. This, this is something that is going to change with time. stress right. and also this value, both of them, and this one too. We're, we're gonna see a little bit more clearly when, when we get to an example. Okay, we haven't seen what this uh, strain hardening, hardening rule looks like, but we'll, s we'll see an example in a bit. But basically what that does that is it modifies the material. It, make it, it makes it either weaker or stronger. All right, number three, we need something which is called strain decomposition. And basically uh, what this is, is that our strain is going to be the result of an elastic strain plus a plastic strain. And our assumption is that we can divide those two that we can have a, a domain in which we just have elastic strain and after we get to yield stress, we have plastic strain and we can add those two. So in this theory, we're not going to assume that we have simultaneously elastic and plastic strain. Number four, we need something which is called a plastic flow rule. <coughs> 
And what this plastic flow rule is, is it tells you what are the plastic strains as a function of changes of stress. Before we had just elasticity and a simple multiplication to tell us what was elastic strain as a function of change of uh, stresses. But, but now that's not going to be the case anymore. And we'll see in an example that to uh, why we cannot use that simple uh, equation that we used before anymore. And fifth, we need something which is called an elastic unloading criterion. And basically this is what happens if I go through yield and then I unload? Will, will that slope of unloading be the same as the one for loading? Would it be different? That depends on the model that you use. And the simplest model will consider that unloading is the same as loading. OK, so thi this is a little bit abstract, but uh, le let's see an example which is going to clarify this a, a lot more. And in this example, we're going to see how these equations look like for the more Coulomb criterion, or I should say just for the Coulomb criterion. All right, uh, w what is the equation of the Mohr Coulomb criterion or the Coulomb criterion? If you remember, this is shear yield. Yes, Bethany? Yes. Let me call it UCY because uh, I'll tell you why in just in a little bit. But is that equation, and that's in, in the space of principal stresses, in the more space, this looks like, like this, tangent of phi, where this is the normal. It's the same, same thing, just in a different space. Let's see how that looks in a sigma three, sigma one space. This is going to be just a line, a relatively steep line, where the intercept is going to be the unconfined compression. We, we used to call it strength, but now I'm going to call it yield because this is going to be our yield surface. And it doesn't mean that it necessarily like fails catastrophically, but at that point we get to the yield stress at which we start to have a plastic strain. Okay, and in this line, if this is one, the slope is equal to Q. Okay, let's see what this looks like in a block that I, I might load. Uh, what? Let's see what this looks in a, in a block that we load with sigma one, sigma three, and also sigma two. Let's say this is the minimum principal stress, this is the maximum principal stress, and this is the intermediate principal stress. This block is going to fail in shear at an angle of do you remember what this angle was? 
this one let's call it beta it's 45 degrees plus a friction angle divided by 2 okay and in this condition this block is going to move down because look that's where the direction in which the the largest stress pushing this one is going to move up and you can also think of this example as why this doing this or oh, oh first of all why is it pushing against sigma 3 and not against sigma 2 could I have a failure surface in which instead of being a wedge which is kind of perpendicular to sigma 3 on this side could be perpendicular to sigma 2 w would, would that make sense knowing that these are my stresses I, I hope you see that it doesn't make sense because why would you why would you push against sigma 2 when sigma 3 is the lowest so this wedge is going to fail at this angle but also automatically the direction is going to find a position so such that it pushes against sigma 3 as it moves down instead of sigma 2. In geology, if this is a normal fault, this is what we, we would call the hanging wall and this one the foot wall. This will be the strike of the fault and the strike of the fault will be perpendicular to the minimum principal stress. And we will say that the hanging wall is uh, moving down uh, relative to the foot wall and that's what is called a normal fault but just in terms of mechanics I, I hope you can see that this is going to go down because sigma 1 is larger than sigma 3 and is pushing against sigma 3 as it moves down because sigma 3 is the lowest stress all right okay let's do a little bit more of math in order to to get to where I want our yield surface is going to be this equation but uh, I'm going to move some of the terms in order to make this F uh, at yield equal to zero so this is going to be just moving these terms to the to the left hand side it's going to look like this so now this is going to be my yield surface F Okay. Oh, we, we already knew all of this. Uh, this is where there is a new thing right now. We're going to define this flow rule that is going to tell us what is the plastic strain as a function of the state of stress and this is I'm going to write it looks like this for now don't worry about what that is this is just a constant okay and this is where it gets interesting what this equation is telling me is that the changes in plastic strain are going to be proportional to the gradient of the yield surface when I consider changes with respect to stress and this may look a little bit uh, difficult to understand right now but we'll see what this equation says for this case yeah to the gradient of the yield surface with respect to the uh, the stress that you consider for example if here you have epsilon 1 1 this should be sigma 1 1 okay. all right 
so, uh, but, but but you'll see now that this is, it, it gets a, a lot simpler now when we start to interpret this in terms of geometry rather than in terms of just uh, abstract equations. Okay. This surface, which is, uh, this, this is the yield surface, which here just looks like a line, but, but it is a surface, uh, is going to have a gradient and it's going to have a normal direction. So normal to this line, I'm going to have a vector n. And that vector n is going to depend on the gradient of this surface. And mathematically, it can be written like this. It's a vector. So it's going to have, uh, in this case, three components because we have three principal stresses. Uh, and these are just going to be partial derivatives of this function with respect to each of the stresses. Notice that in this line, we don't have sigma 2 because the Coulomb criterion doesn't care about sigma 2. So that, that's why it's not in there. And we, we, we don't need it for, for the equations that we're going to write. Okay, so this is going to be valid for any yield surface. Let's see what this looks like for the Coulomb surface. So derivative of f with respect to sigma 1 is going to be equal to 1. Uh, I'm looking at this, this one. So just derivative, partial derivative of this function with respect to sigma 1, one. which is 1. What about with respect to sigma 2? And with respect to sigma 3? Negative Q. Negative Q. Okay. Okay, so what this tells me is that this vector n is going to have these components. In the direction of sigma 1, it's going to be uh, 1. I should, I should have made this steeper, but let's see if I... Uh, it looks too square. And let, let, let me improve this. I think now it looks a little bit better. So th these are the, the components that uh, I have here. And where in direction uh, of sigma 1 is going to be 1, and in direction of sigma 3 is going to be negative q. Uh, just to put some numbers into this. Let's say the friction angle is equal to 30 degrees. Then what is going to be the value of Q? You remember that? That's a number that, that you should remember. Very useful. Three. It's going to be equal to 3. So what that means is that in this line, if the slope, if this slope is 1 to 3, the normal here, this is going to be 1, this is going to be negative 3. And let's see what that means in terms of the plastic strengths. Now let's use this equation in order to tell what the plastic strains are going to be. All right. So the plastic strain number one is going to be this constant uh, differential lambda times if I'm talking about strain in direction one, which we in this direction, is just equal to this one times one. If I talk about the strain in direction two, it's going to be 
that constants times zero. And that kind of makes sense because if you imagine this hanging wall moving on top of, of the foot wall, it's not going to move in direction two. It doesn't have any reason to move in direction two. It just moves down in direction of sigma one and it sort of resembles like a compression. That's why it is positive. And it's going to move in that direction too, uh, looking like a dilation. And that's why this is going to be negative. Negative Q. So now with this flow rule, we have, uh, we can tell what the plastic strains are when we get to the yield surface. And again, with the, what these equations are telling you is that when you get to the yield surface, this one is going to continue compressing this direction and it's going to get larger in this direction. But there is something here that uh, we uh, should uh, pay attention to. If I consider at yield these three stresses, what will be the volumetric strain at yield? I just have to add these three. Common factor is this constant, and if I add this one to that one to this one, is going to be equal to this. And we know that typical values of Q are going to be about three. So therefore, this is going to be, all of these, considering this is a positive quantity, this is going to be a negative quantity, and it's going to be a dilation. So when we get to yield, this coulomb Fayer criterion with this flow rule, which is called, I'm going to go further here and write this, it's called an associated flow rule. I want to explain what that is in a bit. It predicts a dilation. And now with all these equations, we can predict what is going to be the elastoplastic response of this rock when you get to failure. Let's do that. This is our typical strain stress plot. In the elastic region, Stress is proportional to strain, right? Let's say that it gets to this value. Let's say this is one is epsilon one in direction of the maximum principal stress. Let's also plot the strain in direction three and I'm saying that all of these are going to be elastic, right? If we assume isotropic elasticity, what is going to be epsilon three? No. Oh. The Poisson ratio times, times this one, but not only that, it's going to be negative Poisson ratio times that. So it's going to be is dilation, but it's going to be a small one. That it's a function of the Poisson ratio. So it's going to be something like this. And this is all elastic, okay? Uh, let me add one more component here. The volumetric strain as a function of this epsilon one. If epsilon one, which is a compression, and epsilon three, which is a dilation, we know that for a Poisson ratio less than 0.5, when we compress a rock in axial compression, the whole rock should compress, should not dilate. That's why the 
Poisson ratio less than 0.5. So we're going to have a contraction here, which that's going to be the volumetric strain. It's going to be positive because it is a, construct, a contraction. All right, so all of this is elastic. I apply compression in one direction, I get contraction in the same one, a little bit of dilation in direction perpendicular to it, but overall it's a compression. Let's add now the plastic part. We're going to assume that we are in perfect plasticity. And what that means in perfect plasticity is that when I get to the yield stress, that uh, peak stress is not going to change at all. All right, so according to the questions that I have above, and if I assume perfect plasticity, if I have this amount of plastic strain uh, in direction one, notice that this one is still the continuation of epsilon one, how many times this is going to be in epsilon three? It's gonna be Q times, and let's say Q is equal to three, so this is going to be three times that. Let's say one, two, three. So for this little bit of contraction in direction one, I'm going to get this change in direction three. And because the dilation in direction three is gonna be a lot higher than the direction of contraction in direction one, after I get to the yield point, according to this model, this one, and it's going to go into the other side, is going to be a dilation. And that's going to be the plastic part. And in this case, I'm assuming perfect plasticity. which means no hardening. And the objective again is to predict what strains look after you get to the yield point. Let me show an, an example of this uh, to, let me see where I find that. Um, Let me see if I find it in my notes quickly. Okay. Okay, so this is what we're trying to do. As you see, there are materials that once you get to yield stress, they might maintain more or less that same strength. Uh, and those who will be, will say that those are perfectly plastic, that once you get to the yield limit, they just keep the same value. Materials that after the peak, they have a lower strength, will say that those are strain softening and materials that after they get to the yield stress, they receive e even a harder uh, or a higher strength, those materials we say that those are strain hardening. And our objective now is to try to have a model that predicts this response. And so far we have been seen this case, uh, which is the perfect plastic uh, material with more Coulomb. So with the questions that we have right now, we will be able more or less to fit a model to, let's say, the experimental data for a confining 
a pressure of 84.5 megapascals. But for the other ones, we can't. And so we, we need to, to develop some other theory that will allow us to do that. And let's get this work on that. Okay, so the more Coulomb criterion then, as we have seen with this uh, flow rule, now we can uh, predict plastic strains. Don't worry about whether what this is right now. It doesn't uh, really matter much for now. But now we can predict the strains which do not increase anymore, but to get to a maximum, that maximum is gonna be given by the yield stress. And we also predict dilation after we get to the yield stress. However, there is a problem with this type of formulation. Well, this, the first thing is that it's just perfect plasticity. But there is another problem. Uh, the problem is that in this case, your model predicts that your plastic strains perpendicular to the load are significantly higher than the one you get in the direction of the load. And that's not very realistic. And because of that, there is a slight modification to this flow rule that you can use, still with the same, uh, with the same equation or the same flow rule, it's just a slightly different. So let me write this again. Whenever we have a flow rule in which we use the yield surface. That's what is called an associated flow rule. And um, basically means that the flow rule is associated with the directly the yield surface. But as we saw in the case of the Mohr Coulomb criterion, sometimes that may yield some, uh, some problems uh, overestimating dilation. So instead of that, when you get to the yield surface, you could use an alternative equation or a, an alternative surface, which is not going to be the yield surface anymore but it's going to be another function, which is called the plastic potential function. And in this case, this plastic potential function G is going to be different from the yield surface. And this is what is called a non-associated flow rule because the plastic potential function is different than the yield surface. In the associated flow rule, the plastic potential function is the same as the yield surface. And for example, for, for this Coulomb criterion that tends to predict a very high dilation when you get to the, to the yield conditions, simply what you can do is use a plastic potential function G which looks more or less the same as the yield surface. But now the coefficient Q that, let me write it here. Q is one plus sine of the friction angle divided one minus sine of the friction angle. The function G is going to use another angle psi, but the equation looks more or less the same. Okay, and uh, what do you think? Should this new angle be smaller or bigger than the friction angle? The problem was that using phi gave us too much of a dilation, and the dilation is directly 
a function of this parameter q that was too big. So if you want a smaller parameter q, what you have to do is to have a smaller angle. So this dilation angle is not a friction angle. Now it's a di di dilation angle is going to be smaller than, than the friction angle. Let's see a little bit more in detail what this angle is going to be. And now we're going to have uh, different cases. If the dilation angle is still higher than 0, Q is going to be uh, bigger than 1. And this is going to be still a dilation. If dilation angle is equal to 0, then the parameter Q is just going to be equal to 1. And this is just going to be no dilation, no contraction, uh, something which sometimes is referred as isochoric deformation which that means no change of volume. And finally, if the friction angle is smaller than zero, we can get that at failure, this is going to be a contraction. So now by having this new plastic potential function, uh, we can have not only dilation as we had before, but we can have also uh, no change of volume and contraction also when we get uh, to the yield surface. And let me write this in terms of, uh, in, in a plot, so it's a li li little bit easier to, uh, to understand. And I'm going to go one step further here as soon as I get my pencil working. Just a little bit of patience. I don't know what's going on. looks like I'm going to have to use ink. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Yeah? Uh, wait, wait. I'm going to try to fix it. Don't worry. Any question? David? No? I was saying actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, I think I can fix it in a few seconds. Uh, so, no? Everything okay? Okay, so, so again, um, we are just uh, developing these equations to predict plastic strains. So far we just consider uh, dilation, but now we are able to consider also contraction. And, uh, Okay, let's see how far I can go with ink. Yeah, I have a pencil. You have a pencil? Yeah. Uh, but what size is your pencil? It's 0.5? This is 0.5. 0.5. I want 0.7. You have 0.7. Uh, I, I, I think I can do it with ink. Don't worry. Because 0.5 sometimes you cannot see very well here. It, yeah, it, it's kind of thin. Uh, okay, so we have seen what this friction angle looks like in this uh, sigma 1. Uh, sigma 3 space, and actually you could also think of, of this as here a deviatoric stress, sigma 1, sigma 3. And it, it, it's the same thing. Here you're going to have, let's say, if this is 1, this is going to be Q. And the friction angle is going to depend on that. And this is going to be similar uh, with, if you talk uh, about this in terms of shear stress and normal stress, right? Uh, 
So I'm going to do it small here. This is shear stress. This is normal stress. This is going to be your friction angle. Uh, but let's just go one step further. Um, always knowing that in the y-axis I have some sort of deviatoric stress and in the x-axis I have a normal stress, I can also make these plots in terms of P and Q. If you remember what P and Q were, uh, Q was a deviatoric stress and P was a mean stress. So Q is a function of J2 and P is another function of the mean stress. Yes. And uh, I can do exactly the same thing uh, with this type of, uh, of variables. Uh, again, on the x-axis I have a mean stress, on the y-axis I have a, a deviatoric stress, and if I had a, a yield surface that looks more or less like this, what this is going to mean is that for example, if at some location I have a positive slope, the normal direction is going to be in this, in this direction, and this will be uh, a direction in which I will have a dilation. Whenever this plastic uh, potential surface or yield surface, if it's associated root, it has a positive slope, that means dilation. Whenever I get into a region in which this is flat, this is going to be no, dil no dilation. And whenever I get into a region where this one has a negative slope, then this is going to be a region of contraction. So I could broadly define this more or less like that, where for the same yield surface, I have dilation, I have no change of volume, and I have contraction. And if you look at the normal vector now in this case, uh, we can partition any of these uh, strains into a component in the that direction of the deviatoric stress Q and into the direction of the mean stress P. And uh, wait, 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 what's the opposite? This one is P, this is in the direction of P, uh, P prime actually, effective stress and this one is in the direction of Q. So for example, what this means is that when you get to a location like somewhere over here, there is no deviatoric strain, there is just compression strain in plastic direction. When you are at a position like this, there is no change of volume, there is just all the component is in direction of deviatoric stress. So it will just be a deviatoric strain. Uh, for example, imagine a plane moving relative to the other and not changing in volume at any time. It's not dilating, it's not contracting. And if we wanted to get a little bit more of a micromechanical perspective, 
uh, I could make some drawings. Let's see, let's see if I get it now. Okay, I think I got it. All right. Uh, if we look at the at the um, micromechanic perspective, that would mean imagine some grains, very tightly locked, that at low mean stress, if you want to shear this. These grains will have to roll over the other grains, and that's going to cause a dilation. And notice that that's because there is uh, just uh, there is a mean stress, which is relatively low, so that that's not going to make these grains crash. On the other hand, if the mean effective stress is pretty high, close to over here and you try to do the same to make these grains move relative to each other in shear, if the mean effect effective stresses are very high, these grains are going to start to break. And instead of a dilation, if the grains break, you may even have a contraction because now this is going to fill in the pores of the big grains. So here you have dilation, low mean stress, large mean stress. You could have a contraction together with the shear. And somewhere in between, in isochoric deformation, you just can have a deformation or a shear strain that it doesn't involve any dilation or any contraction. And there is basically no change in, in volume. And again, as I was telling before, you can imagine this as one plane just moving relative to, it, to the other uh, without any change in volume, but just failing in, in shear. Yes, Jack. Well, this one, yeah, this mechanism will be more valid for sandstones. And uh, you could also apply this to other materials, but this micromechanical analysis would probably uh, will not work. For example, I don't know, in a carbonate, in a bar carbonate, uh, if you have dilation, then you may have fractures that uh, create fracture asperities, and those dilate while if you have a lot of compression, you may have poor collapse and the failure might localize. This is an example in this region where you have contraction and shear or something that we talked about uh, last class, but I'd like to remind you again about a shear compaction band in which you have shear, but also you have crushing of the grains within the shear failure. And here we have one example. Where in this particular location, you see that some of the grains have, uh, have been uh, crushed and now they are, uh, instead of just being one big particle, it's many particles. And uh, because uh, the mean effective stress was, was basically too high. If you don't have such a large effective stress, then probably you will go rather through dilation. And I remember we saw a better example of this somewhere over here. Let me find it one more time, this one. So this one is super clear how uh, we have a grain communion at the shear band. And the higher the, the relative displacement, 
uh, then the more combination you're going to have. All right, what time is it? 5 p.m. All right, well, I'd like to, to close today just with some drawings, but without many equations, uh, just to extend what we have seen so far, particularly this case, to the actual model that we're going to work with in the homework. But it is exactly the same idea. It's capturing all of this into one uh, mathematical model. And this model is part of a, a school of plasticity, which is called critical state uh, soil mechanics. It was originally uh, developed for soils, but uh, we found we find more and more applications uh, in. Uh, in geologic applications or in petroleum applications uh, to, to rocks as well. And the particular one that we're going to see is called the Cambridge clay model, uh, which is uh, just goes by Cam, Cam clay model. And we're going to see, there is a version for cemented materials but we're going to see the uncemented version because it's a little bit easier to deal with. And in this type of model, we're going to have this analysis in terms of mean effective stress and deviatoric stress. Okay, let's start with the shear part. For the shear uh, criterion, uh, for uh, the Coulomb criterion, we just have a line, right? A line tells us what is the maximum uh, shear stress in f as a function of the normal stress. And here it's going to be the same. And it's going to be a line which we're going to call the critical state line. And it's gonna have a slope equal to M. What it means is that when Q is equal to m times p prime, then we are at this critical state line. And, le and let, let's see what that means uh, in, in a bit. All right, and there is one more thing in here. This is just the shear part, okay? But also we're going to have a compression yield surface. And this is going to look as an ellipsoid. Something like this. And we can also assume that there is going to be a second half of that ellipsoid somewhere over here. Where now this one and is going to be our yield surface. This ellipsoid is going to have some characteristic points. Probably the most important one is going to be this P naught prime. This is the maximum stress doing just a pure isotropic loading to which you can get before you develop a plastic strain. So this is just a compression limit. And 
we're not going to do that type of test. What we're going to do now is a axial compression test. So let's imagine that we have a sample that we have a stresses sigma 3, sigma 2, and here we have sigma 1, which actually is the one that we're going to change. So this is going to be a typical triaxial test with uniaxial compression loading. Or I could just call it diatoric uh, compression loading. I keep sigma 2 and sigma 3 the same, and those are constant, and I change sigma 1. OK. Uh, if I do this, what I'd like to look at is what is the change of P prime and Q in order to, to see where this, this is going to plot. P prime, if you remember, is just the mean effective stress. And Q is going to be the deviatoric stress, sigma 1 minus uh, sigma 3. The, 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 that's just a definition. All right. If I increment sigma 1 and amount delta sigma 1, then what is going to be delta P prime? If this is similar as you know taking a derivative, derivative of P prime with respect to sigma 1 is going to be 1 third. So this is going to be delta sigma 1 divided by 3. And if I change sigma 1, the change in deviatoric stress is going to be derivative of this respect to sigma 1, just 1. So this is, is going to be just delta sigma 1. I, I, I want this because I, I need to plot this in this plot, and when I want I want to know is what is the stress path of this type of test. And this is just basically delta Q divided delta P prime, uh, which in this case is going to be delta sigma 1 divided delta sigma 1 divided by 3, and that's equal to 3. So what that means is that in this plot, that I have on the top, if I do this kind of test, the slope of a line here is going to be a slope 1 to 3. All right, so let's do that. Let me first do a test that goes, start somewhere over here. If I start loading and do triaxial compression, Q is going to increase because I'm increasing sigma 1 and keeping sigma 2 and sigma 3 constant, but P is also going to increase because P includes sigma 1. And what that means is that they both are going to increase. It's just that Q is going to increase three times more what P prime does. And this is going to be a line that is going to be like this with a slope 1 to 3. And according to this model, if I run this kind of test, this may get a little bit difficult to, to see at first, but you see that later it's not too complicated. 
here what I'm plotting, this is the deviatoric stress, sigma 1 minus sigma 3, and this is epsilon 1, something that we already know what it looks like. It's basically stress versus strain, axial stress versus axial strain. And when I follow this path, then I should have a reaction or deformation which is somehow like this until we get to this point. After we get to this line, and it, we consider this as the yield surface on this side of that surface, this is going to start to change. It's not going to be elastic anymore. So this is, from here to here, this is elastic. After it gets to that point, it's not elastic anymore, and it's going to go until a maximum point, which is going to be uh, somewhere over here, and that's going to show a peak, and then it's going to start to go down, and it's going to turn into an asymptotic value, something like this. And because the stress goes down, this stress part is actually looks something like this. You increase the stress, but once you get to the peak stress, it comes back, and it comes back into this, uh, what is called critical state line, which is a line at which after it gets to there, there is no more change of volume anymore. So it reaches a more or less a steady state condition. So notice that it continues deforming in direction one or with a deviatoric loading, uh, but it's not going to change volume anymore. All right, this is the typical response that we say that it has a very well-defined peak stress and it is strain softening because the more strain you apply, the weaker it gets. That's a possibility number one. According to this same model, we also can have a material that if we start loading it somewhere over here at the higher mean stress, with the same type of loading, let me move a little bit more to the left, so I have a space to do that. Let's say somewhere over here. I do a triaxial test, also with slope one to three, and now I go through the yield surface through this section, I'm going to see something different. I'm going to see that I will start loading, I will pass a yield surface. Once I get to the yield surface, I will start developing plastic strains, and that's going to be a point somewhere over there. And once you get to the plastic strain and to the yield surface, this is gonna start to look like this, and again it's going to going to turn into an asymptotic trend. Let me fix this. That is going to go into an asymptotic value which is higher than the yield stress. And this is what is called strain hardening because as you load it more and more, it gets stronger and stronger. But then it's going to end at that maximum value. That's the maximum strength at which you can get uh, with this uh, initial uh, confining stress. But the big message here is, is very simple, and it is that you can have the same material, but depending what is your initial mean stress, 
it could be either a material which is strain hardening or could be strain softening. Could be a material that goes through a well-defined peak or it goes into an asymptotic tr trend with an increase in strength. And if you remember, this is more or less what we saw over here. In this example, we have uh, a, uh, a marble rock and the same rock, depending on what is the level of confining pressure, it can go to a very well-defined peak and then into strain softening, or if you have a higher mean stress, to strain hardening. So with these equations now, uh, we're going to be able to uh, predict what is going to be the change of plastic strain as we change the stress. And mm, we, we will not do that today, but basically uh, the next step is going to be to use this line or the yield surface. Remember that always perpendicular to this, I'm going to have the plastic strain and this is going to have two components, the one in direction of the viatoric stress and the one in direction of the mean stress. Uh, we're going to see what this equation looks like and how you can predict those uh, plastic strains after the yield point. One more thing, um, this phenomenon of, if this is sigma one and this is epsilon one, of seeing something like this with increasing sigma three or increasing mean stress is something which is called brittle to ductile transition. Okay, well, I think that's, that's everything for today. And then we'll pick it up from here on Monday and uh, we'll work a little bit with the equations that allow us to uh, compute all these plastic strains and then we'll talk about the next project that utilizes uh, this model in order to predict over pressure in uh, soft matrox. All right? Yes. All right. I'll see you guys on Monday.